and welcome to Outlaw Gamer Radio, the official podcast of OutlawGamers.com. This is the show where we live to play and play to live. I'm Brent Adams, joined by a man who thinks crackdown is a problem 93% of plumbers need to look into, Mr. Lauren Baumgarten. Lauren! <laughs> What's up, Brent Adams? Because God knows the rest of us are looking into it. I thought when you, when you started down that road, I thought for sure this was gonna, that was going to be a reference to somehow not having enough crack. <laughs> you know, that's the irony of crack, is that you can never have enough. That's true. Crack, crack, the ironic drug. Uh, uh, how are you, buddy? Wow, we have, we have, uh, we had, ha- have a, a big week. We talked last week about, uh, did we think Gamescom was important or that there would be a lot of information? And, uh, we're going to jump into the garage here momentarily. And we have got quite a bit of stuff coming out of Gamescom this year. I would, uh, I would have to agree. And as a matter of fact, that leads me to a slight breach of etiquette, which is going to be the poll results. Here at the top of the oh show, my God. because oh my God. I think that they are kind of relevant to what we're going to be talking about for the next little while in the garage. Would you like to go ahead and share those poll results, Lauren? Yeah, so we asked you guys last week, we were talking about Gamescom, and we asked you, are you expecting any big announcements to come out at Gamescom? And here's how your answer shook out versus the reality. So coming in in last place was the Gears of War stuff is probably the biggest news we'll get. So if you remember... You were uh, right! <laughs> the Gears of no, War, I'm there were some announcements about Gears of War just before Gamescom. That was 11%. And then you guys split the vote, uh, about 40, 46 to 43% coming in in second place with definitely the show has grown so big, it's now a great platform to make news. That came in in second place at 43%. You guys were right. Um, and coming in in first place at 46% was the answer no. The hardware software companies still don't treat it seriously enough and i guess brent microsoft is treating it seriously enough microsoft definitely is so you could argue i mean i guess if you talk about was there a lot of news coming out of uh gamescom i don't know if there was a lot of news per se in terms of launches i mean not a lot of like i don't think there were a lot of world premieres in the way that you'd expect something like e3 right but certainly there was some there, there was some big like reveals made, like like first looks at games that we knew were going to be coming out. A lot of gameplay, which I really, which is really what we want to see. Honestly, I mean, I'd rather yeah. see this. Seemed to be like a, a conference f- filled with gameplay reveals or deeper dives into gameplay. And you're right, not a lot of world premieres. But candidly, I, I don't know. It's actually interesting. I kind of part of me really would rather see ten gameplay reveals of games we haven't seen gameplay of than just announcements. Yeah, well, I, I agree with that. I mean, announcements are fine. It's great to get excited, but Actually, seeing games being played is always more relevant, at least for me. So I- I'm really, really happy with what we've seen at Gamescom, even though Microsoft uh, announced a lot of exclusives that I don't have access to, not being an Xbox One owner. They showed off some great stuff, and I thought, I, I guess that, uh, I-, I guess that you know what I said a second ago about Microsoft took Gamescom seriously. They did, and I think that it's paid off for them well. I think they've gotten a lot of people's attention. They didn't have a lot of counter programming coming from Sony with the big press conference and a lot of reveals of their own. That's not to say there wasn't anything from Sony there, but Microsoft definitely was, uh, was generating a lot of headlines out of Gamescom this week, so good for them. Yeah, absolutely, man. So we've got eight separate trailers to talk about in the garage today, and there are, there are ones we left out, Brent. Oh, yeah. Um, this is not everything. <laughs> All of them, I really, again, really pleasantly surprised by the kind of the amount of information that we got out of Gamescom. And so let's just jump right into it, Brent. I know that one that a lot of Xbox One owners have been looking forward to, and, and really hasn't been on my radar at all, and I don't, I don't think you, yours either, no. uh, is Scalebound. Yeah. So uh, Scalebound is a Microsoft exclusive, an Xbox exclusive, right. uh, that has been uh, uh, that, that had been revealed previously, but uh, I be- I'm not sure if this is the first time we got gameplay or if this is the first time we got extended gameplay. Um, but a lot more information about Scalebound coming out uh, during Gamescom. Brent, we have an eight-minute extended gameplay demo that we're linking to here. Um, obviously, this comes with the caveat that neither you and I own Xbox uh, Ones at this point, nope. which I think does inform our relationship to trailers uh, to, to these kinds of trailers because you know it's not something that we look forward to because we're, we're not going to be getting it when it comes out, but uh, which is unfortunate. But Brent, what did you think? Uh, you and I talked a little bit about this before the show. What was your opinion of the eight-minute uh, gameplay demo that was shown for Scalebound? You know, I really like the actual gameplay. I, I, I dig the, the mechanics that were being shown off, and I definitely like the idea of the, 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 the quasi 
the quasi strategy aspect involving your dragon companion and and having the dragon you know attack various mobs or or structures or whatever while you're doing the uh, the one on one fighting. I dig a lot of the things that we saw in the way of the gameplay. I got to say though that I find myself incredibly cynical about the character design of the uh, of the antagonist, or at least the antagonist we saw in this gameplay. Uh, the something something about the way that he's put together just made me feel like a focus group got together and they said, "Okay, right, we've got to make an antagonist that's going to appeal to the disaffected youth of the civilized world. What do we need?" And like they just start like throwing spaghetti against the wall, and somebody's like, uh, "What if he's got a dragon arm?" Like, yeah, give him a fucking dragon arm. And the other arm, he's like, that, "That's free." And he's got a sword, and he's got like a really cool bespoke leather jacket. And ah, uh, I don't know, like it's not disaffected enough. What else? What else? What else? How about Beats headphones? Brilliant! We just made a fucking million dollars on this son of a bitch. Give him some fucking Beats headphones. And then they realized that Beats was owned by Apple, and so that they they went with something else but i don't know there's just something about the character design that like i can't like i can't quite get over and tell myself like this was somebody's artistic vision they were like this is the fucking lead character video games have needed for 40 years like there's just something about him that seems cynical to me and somebody's like we're just going to cobble together a bunch of things that hopefully people will like recognize themselves in and then people will like our game and i'm like you know the gameplay looks solid you didn't need to do that but like I said, that's just me, and I don't own an Xbox One. So what do I no, know? I, I agree with you, Brent. I mean, I think I thought the gameplay was interesting, too. I thought that, uh, I, I mean, certainly uh, this is not, uh, I don't know when Scalebound is scheduled to come out right now, but uh, yeah, certainly see. this is not a finished game, obviously. There were definitely no, some it's glitches. Pre-alpha. In the, it's pre-alpha. Right, yeah, so uh, there were definitely some, you They're know. They're saying quarter four 2016, by the way. Okay, so, uh, but I also think the mechanics are super interesting. I, I love the idea of working with a dragon. It, it's this weird combination of, like, Having that that pet companion yeah. and having like a star destroyer at your disposal, which exactly. I think is like yeah. is super interesting. But and think about what they can do with the story. Like think about like the relationship as it develops over the story. Think about like you know the part of the story you get to where the, either the dragon dies or you think the dragon dies, and how like emotional that could be. I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff they can do with that relationship. Yeah, I agree. I also agree with you that I felt like the uh, that I felt like the um, the main character was. Uh, like you said, I, I feel like it was made by like a, a, a 65 or 70 year old Japanese person. I only pictured uh, pick Japanese just being that it's a culture that's outside of America. Like I feel like it's it's uh, it's this sort of hyperbolic idea of what a, an American antagonist should be. Right. Uh, and, it fe- and and frankly, he feels more that that character feels more in place than something like Jet Set Radio or something like that. I it's, agree. Yeah. It, it was it was very odd to me. Uh, yeah. The choice now I, I haven't. That's the only video I've watched. Uh, I have not watched. I've not read anything else about it, so I don't know if there's, you know, if it makes more sense in a, in context that I'm not seeing. Um, but uh, yeah, I thought it was an odd choice. Interesting though, and I'm curious to hear. I know there was a lot of chatter about it on the website, and so I'm curious, or, or at least anticipation. There, I didn't read a lot of chatter after the demo came out. I'm curious to hear what those who have been waiting for it uh, think about this trailer. As do I. Um, all right. Well, let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and move on. I think that. Uh, well, and, and I guess the, just one last thing. One last thing on Scalebound is just that the idea of having a uh, co-op multiplayer for this—that's fucking cool. Like I, I did co-op right. in in almost all its forms, and so that little bit of like the reveal, like there at the end of the trailer, we're like, uh oh, co-op this motherfucker. I was like, actually, that's kind of cool. Like, I I could definitely be down for that. And I and agree. the idea that you can like customize, I guess you know, your companion and everything. All right, so I, I'm I'm trying to give him some props, even though that guy that guy sucks. Anyway, um, <laughs> talk about something else that sucks is Homefront. <laughs> it was a <laughs> shitty game. It, it it wasted the talent of a great writer and filmmaker, John Milius, and and squandered it in just a torrential downpour of bullshit. Uh, I understand that the multiplayer was better than the single player, but I guess... And and when is that not true these days? But anyway, the point is, fuck Homefront. Piece of shit game, and I wasted my time playing it. But they're trying to get me back, Lauren. They're trying to get me back with this fucking Homefront The Revolution, which obviously is set uh, farther down the road in the the, uh, 
occupation uh, of North America by North Korea. And I I actually kind of dug the, the gameplay demo. I actually thought there was some kind of neat things going on here. Even though like first-person shooters aren't necessarily my, my end-all, be-all genre, I did dig the part towards the beginning where you're going through the level on the motorbike. Like there's just something about that that really captured my imagination. I was like, that, that's like I've always wanted to do something like that. Like, like it looks so fucking fun, just navigating this urban sprawl environment and all of this, you know, all these junked out cars and everything on the uh, on the the motocross bike. I I kind of thought that was cool. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, like story is a big part of this thing for me, and I always thought the premise of the game was strong, just the execution that was weak. So I guess I'm willing to come back to the fold. I would really like for this. To maybe kind of deliver on the potential that I I see in in the whole in the whole concept. Yeah, so this is an interesting one for me, Brent, because of course everything you said about the original Homefront is true. Um, I, I I I really kind of went up and down throughout the pro. I actually watched more than just this trailer. I watched a couple other things on it, yep. and I was I was up and down on, on my feelings about it. At times, it felt so. First of all, I'm very concerned about the uberfication of this game. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, and, and actually we're going to talk about this yeah. in a couple other games. And, you, and I think at you this point, wrong. at this point, I think it's ready to become a term. So, okay. uh, if you go to cry, so this is done by deep silver and Crytek, and it's using the cry engine. Uh, and if you go to cry Engine's website, they call it a free roam FPS, which is essentially, it's an open world game. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and which, which the first game was not, no. um, and, Although it would have uh, been cool if it had, probably it c- it could have been. And, and o- open world is is and isn't this the style that like Crisis and, and games like that are typically done in, where there's you know you've got like a much larger sort of game world that you're just doing different things within. No, cri- well, yes and n- no. Crisis no, I'm is so, more. I'm, I'm sorry, I said I said Crisis. I'm talking about Far Cry. Like this Far is Cry, more. Right. The, this is more in the vein of something like a Far Cry. Right. So Crisis is more of a, a straight. It's kind of a corridor shooter, but there's. No, they, they, I just I said the I, I was thinking Crytek and I just said the wrong fucking. Well, I would game. actually like to see. I, I would actually like. To, I really liked what Crisis, uh, the most recent Crisis, did, which is that it's it's a uh, corridor shooter ish, maybe not a corridor shooter, but it's it's a. Uh, um, but each each space you go from space to space, and it becomes a little mini open world when you attack it. So there's ten different ways to attack each issue, kind of like Deus Ex. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, so I love this world, man, and, and, and but it felt there are a couple things that concern me about this trailer. One is the uberfication of just that idea of, and, and, and this is akin to what we talked about before of, of open world games with all the side missions and how it's set up. I'm worried that it's going to turn into that. Open world is not a bad thing. It's not a good thing. It's whatever you do with it. And in Witcher 3, it's brilliant. Uh, and in games like The Crew or Assassin's Creed, uh, it takes away from the game, in my opinion. And I'm afraid that's what's going to happen here. Uh, I also was concerned when I saw this about a little too much... Um, uh, sort of, um, well, what's the word I'm looking for here? The characterizations re- uh, felt lacking to me. They felt sort of cookie cutter. Yeah. Uh, and I want a deeper story. And what, however, oddly, the world interests me. And the reason I say oddly is because we have post-apocalyptic world after post-apocalyptic world in every video game we have. But this one feels a little bit more Red Dawn to me. It always has. And there's something about it that interests me. Uh, so I keep going back and forth on this one, Brent. I'm not sure. I'm really... My biggest concern is what are they going to do with the open world? Yeah. I think that... I, I don't know. The thing to me is... And I'm thinking about the Far Cry games, I guess just because of Ubisoft or whatever. But um, Yep. The the thing that occurs to me is that if you have this open world where you've got to go from wherever your hideout is to a certain location in order to accomplish some mission or whatever, and then along the way you've got to you've got to dodge patrols, you've got to keep an eye out for you know for guards, for sentries, and all that kind of stuff. Then I I, I dig the idea that every step along the way brings you deeper into the immersion, deeper into the, into, into the situation, not necessarily the storyline, but certainly the situation of occupation, and it just everything becomes gameplay. And I, I dig that idea. Obviously, execution is important, but I can definitely see the idea of you know sitting around in a, a small basement. There's like a single light bulb hanging from the ceiling. There's maps laid out on this card table, and people are discussing, okay, we know that there is a shipment of weapons that is going to be delivered to this garrison 
and we know that it's a truck and we know it's going to be this day, in, like in this time frame. And we, we've got to find a way to do is we got to find a way to get over there and intercept it before it reaches this point. We got to like ambush it in route. So we're going to go to this part of town and do X, Y, and Z. There's something about that quality of, of what you know you could, you could be doing in an open world game. And you know that part of town because you've been by there because you've done other missions there. And it breathes that sort of familiarity, that sort of that, that, that immersive feeling that only open world games can really do where you actually know, you know the terrain and you start to kind of feel a part of the landscape. You start to feel, feel a part of that world. I like that idea, especially it's, with it, this premise. I don't, I don't disagree with you as long as they, <laughs> my, so my concern, and I guess now that as you were talking, I started to sort of, my thoughts started to coalesce a little bit. What I feel like is a Which little is bit of Which is another way of saying you tuned me out. Go ahead. The, no, it's no, 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 no. It's no, fine, no. though. It's fine. Go no, ahead. no, because I'm picturing what you're talking about, <laughs> and I'm thinking, <laughs> um, I'm thinking, so, so uh, the, the lack of depth in the character that I felt like I saw yeah. concerns me about the, the amount of depth in the missions that you're doing. And so I'm, I was thinking sure. about the missions that you were talking about. And, and, well, I mean, and, this guy's uh, no scale bound here. I mean, let's just be honest about well, it. He's not worthy well, to be in that fucking game by the, a long uh, shot. The difference between, you know, Witcher has set the bar high, obviously, as do games like Red Dead Redemption, where if all these missions are have some emotional depth to them, uh, and the missions themselves are deep, and they make sense in the context and the story of the universe, I think they could create something special. Yeah. If they're just fetch quests over and over again, or loot crates, or something like that, then I th- which is what I, which is I believe what, what the lack of what I felt to be the lack of depth of the characters in the demo yeah. uh, uh, makes me think that it's going to be sort of cook, cut and pasted side missions to to you know to get your loot quest or to unlock a radio tower or to and that's what I'm concerned about with this game. And so I feel I want to see more. I, I wasn't blown away by the trailer. Um but I, I love the world. I'm glad somebody's still playing in it and I just you know I think we need to see more for me. I got you. Why don't you go ahead and take the next one? Let's talk a little bit about uh, Crackdown three. Yeah so were you uh were you a crackdown player back in the day? No I was not. No, this is another huge franchise uh, on on uh, the Microsoft uh, platform. Uh, Crackdown, the leaping, jumping, pseudo flying, um, uh, city mass destruction, scaling, um, coin collecting uh, series on uh, Xbox uh, is coming out with Crackdown Three. This was a big announcement uh, when it was revealed at uh, was it E three? It was revealed, or was I can't remember now where it was revealed. I thought so, but but. Um, uh, so we got some gameplay from it, uh, and, and so there's a couple things about the game that really stood out to me, Brent. The big thing that they were highlighting was the uh, destruction in the game, mm-hmm. and the destruction in the game coupled specifically with their multiplayer, and how um, there, you know, there was a little bit, a lot of talk afterwards about how the the game running on Microsoft's cloud servers, you'd be able to destroy and level an entire city, but only um, in multiplayer. But only in multiplayer. Yeah. Um, so there were two things that I felt when I was watching this, Brent, and I also was not. I have played Crackdown one and two, but not. Um, uh, I, I, I wasn't hardcore about playing them. I, I was one of those people that came to those games late or cracked. I think I played Crackdown two, um, and, and it didn't necessarily do a ton for me. And so I'm not. There's a lot of people that are super invested in this IP. Uh, I am not one of those people, but watching this game, I thought two things. So the the leaping and jumping and and the the locomotion in the Crackdown game has always been a cornerstone of that series. Uh, and when watching uh, what they have done uh, in Crackdown Three, which is similar and sort of a step forward for what was done in Crackdown Two, all I could think to myself honestly was, um, ah, that makes me want to play Saints Row Four. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Definitely not the reaction they were going for. No, and I just was like, "Yeah, that looks good," but Saints Row Four, I feel like you know, did it better, and they were you know yucking it up as they were going, and so and, and that right. may not be fair to crack down, but that's what it made me think. Um, uh, and then the other piece of it is destruction, and honestly, like I watched that, and I thought I felt like I was watching a battlefield. Uh, infomercial from five years ago when right. they were all about their destruction. And granted, uh, what Crackdown is showing uh, takes it t- takes that destruction uh, on orders of magnitude further than Battlefield did. Oh, yeah. But I kind of felt like, I, I, okay, I, I don't care. So I could level the whole city. Like, the whole destruction thing was a big deal five years ago when it first started happening. It just didn't feel like that big of a deal to me. You know, I th- I think that it's a good fit for the uh, for the franchise, though. And I mean, I say this as an outsider. I don't. You know, I got no fucking investment in this. But just just from what I know of Crackdown, and from people I've talked to who who have played Crackdown and do like it, it seems like that would be a particularly good fit for 
for multiplayer and crackdown and that it's going to i don't know it, it'll fit the vibe of the game and i mean it, let's let's face it in terms of the destruction that we saw in this in this video we're linking to it was pretty impressive i thought it looked damn good and it certainly looked fun it certainly looked like you'd have opportunities to do some heinous heinous shit in multiplayer and i'm down for all that the the fact that it's only going to be in multiplayer not going to be in single player you know they're they're saying well that's you know that's because number one, you're not con- you're not connected to the cloud in single player, so you can't do it. But it also wouldn't make sense because in the single player campaign, the whole point is that you're supposed to be protecting the city and not leveling it. Whereas obviously, you know, you don't have like these narrative constraints in multiplayer. So okay, fine, you know, no no problem. Like that's all good. But the one thing that uh, th- that is just causing a little bit of controversy, I suppose, is the fact that you know they're saying like next summer or whatever, 2016 for this, but they've had to go back and kind of clarify that it's not the entire game that's going to be available summer 2016, just like the multiplayer. And, you know, it's like, I haven't heard yet. Maybe they've updated at this point and I just haven't read it, but I haven't heard yet if that means like the beta for the multiplayer or if the multiplayer launches ahead of the single player campaign or what that means. But... The thing about that is it just it feels to me like there's still aspects of this game that they haven't quite nailed down yet. And so Microsoft being Microsoft, I would just say maybe back off on the enthusiasm just a hair until this is like really, really concrete, which it doesn't feel like it is right now. Or if it is concrete, it's the kind of concrete that falls apart into tiny huge into gigantic huge chunks when you hit them with a rocket launcher, which <laughs> is is ironic. Given the fact, anyway, anyway, let's move on. This is very funny. I, I am curious to hear. I'm curious to very, hear what fans but... of this series uh, think about uh, about this reveal because, again, it just it didn't do much for me. Um, sort of uh, on the outside, and, and I know it has a big fan base, and I want to. I'm really curious to know if the people that were looking forward to this are looking forward to this. Uh, what, what what they thought about the focus on destruction, what they thought about the aesthetic of the game, um, in general, what they thought about the game, and if it's living up to expectations. Yeah. I don't know. It's it's hard for me to imagine that they're disappointed by what they saw. All right. So uh, up next, Brent, yeah. is uh, a game that we we ha- has existed previously uh, that we have <laughs> known about, uh, like clowns. This, like this like is, we know uh, clowns exist, <laughs> but we don't really talk about them. Yeah, much. That's right. Uh, Divinity, Divinity Original Sin, which is a game that I own and played about two hours of and have not gone back to. Really, uh, which is uh, terrible of me. I just just I don't know why I did not go back to it because I absolutely loved what I played. Um, you might as well go ahead and hand in your man card now, Lauren. That's right. So they they uh, they, they talked about at Gamescom the addition of couch co-op action yeah. on the PS4, which I think is super cool, and presumably the Xbox One version as well. Though this, you know, we're just this was a PS4. Right, I'm sorry, this link was to the PS4. This That's is right, the PlayStation blog, I believe. So yes, um, but uh, so Divinity Original Sin coming out uh, on consoles. Which is also excellent news. They, they, uh, Brent. There was a uh, um, in in reading the article. There was an acronym that I am not familiar with. Oh, CRPGs. Yeah, yeah computer. You had RPG. to point out to me it was computer RPGs. Well, that's um, that's kind of an old school term. I mean, that like that yep. goes that goes back a ways. Yep. Uh, and so, Divinity Original Sin coming to the consoles, coming with couch co op RPG, a uh, hugely hugely popular game. Um, I don't know, Brent. Is this something that you f- see yourself playing? Yeah, uh, as a matter of fact, I've had people ask me why, uh, why, why I'm not already playing Divinity Original Sin. They're like, "Hey, you like Kickstarters? You like turn-based RPGs? How are you not playing Divinity Original Sin?" And I'm like, "That's a logical argument, dog. Way to go." Um, I, I, I don't really, I don't really have have a good reason other than the fact that I, I just don't have as much time to kind of throw into every every game that comes along the way that I used to. But I mean, it like I, I dig the fact that they did the game on Kickstarter. And I mean, they got like a lot of money. Like I think it was over a million dollars, if my if my memory serves. Um, but you know, they got a bunch of money off Kickstarter for this game. And I love. I mean, I love turn based RPGs. It's just you know, it's it's one of those genres of game that is basically only done anymore for nostalgia purposes because it was just. But there's something about the mechanic that feels very, uh, very logical to me. And and there's a certain strategic aspect to uh, to turn based. RPGs that I love. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, like the turn-based thing in XCOM, that got me back. That got me sort of back into that mindset all over again after a long time away. So anyway, but all that comes down to is 
I mean, I can go play this game right now on PC or Mac if I want to. So the question you is, you could, yes, you could. You know, like do it, do it there, or do it on PS4. And I, I got to say that that raises an interesting kind of question in my mind because uh, my my gaming PC is downstairs in my office, and my my day to day life is basically upstairs in our living room playing with my daughter. And when she goes to bed. Typically, I I don't come down here and and play games by myself. Like usually, my wife and I hang out, and uh, and you know maybe we'll watch some TV or you know she'll she'll work on cross stitch and I'll I'll play a game or something on my uh, on my phone or my iPad. So for whatever reason, like I just find myself like not really coming downstairs to play games the way that I used to. And so I kind of dig the idea of maybe getting this on the PS4 and playing it. Playing it that way, uh, it's not the kind of game like I've played on a console in a long time, so that might be kind of a fun experience. So I don't know, like I'm kind of thinking like maybe I'll maybe I'll wait and wait and see and check this out on the console, or I'll just buy one of those uh, fucking Steam links and I'll play the PC version on my TV upstairs over Steam, it, which is it, another way to go. It could go that way too. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, man. I, this is a really interesting game, and I highly I, for those of you that have like considered buying it and haven't, I highly recommend it. I did really, really enjoy it. I, I just think another shiny piece of candy came by when I was playing it. Right? Did you ever? Did you ever like try out like the level editor or anything with it? No, I, I played it in early access, and and I loved it. And then I just decided, I decided that, um, and I think if I remember correctly, they said during early access very clearly that when the game was finally released that you wouldn't be able to save your games, I, I, if I remember correctly. Oh, so you're, you're going to have to start over? Right, and so I think I, what, I, what happened now that I'm, that I'm remembering is that I um, played a couple hours of it, and I went, this game's freaking awesome. I'm not going to sink 40 hours into this game. And then have it reset uh, on you. And then have it reset, so I'm right. just going to wait for it to come out. And by the time it came out, uh, I just was on to other things, and, you know. Yeah, okay, I get that. I highly recommend it. All right, Brent, next up is, again, yeah. more Microsoft, go figure. Probably this is probably my favorite thing as far as the as far as like the Microsoft exclusive games that were shown off. Quantum Break, probably my favorite thing that we looked at. So take that out of sort of relativistic context, Brent. It was your favorite, as you said, relative to the other Microsoft content. But how did you feel about it sort of objectively? You know, I Okay, so there's there's a couple of things that occurred to me. Number one, I like the effect that the gameplay mechanic of being able to sort of stop time or being able to kind of, you know, get, get slippery with time uh, that we see shown off. I dig the way that that came off and the way that it looked. I will say that by the end of the gameplay demo, I was beginning to ask myself, how is this going to feel in terms of pacing? Like, is it going to, is it going to get old fast if, you know, it's like this constant, like start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. And, but then I'm second guessing myself, saying, "Well, I mean, a lot of like a lot of shooters are that. It's just that you don't really recognize that they're doing that. But a lot of shooters are are peaks and lulls in action. You know, uh, you take something like Uncharted. You go into an area, okay, a bunch of guys, big shootout, take a couple of minutes, and then okay, now it quiets down a little bit. Now it's a little bit more about traversal and maybe doing a little platforming, getting to somewhere. Okay, and then another pack of guys. Now we're doing a shootout again. And so there is that. Uh, you know, there's that sort of that sort of uh, peak and release, peak and release sort of sort of rhythm to it, but for some reason, when I was watching this, I, I I was beginning to feel like I don't know, like this could get a little bit exhaustive. But I really would need, I really feel like I need to play it to to really make that evaluation fairly. But in terms of the premise of the game, I'm down for. I, I, I'm a fan of Sean Ashmore as opposed to his talentless fuck of a brother Aaron. No, I'm kidding. Um, but, uh, I, I dig Sean Ashmore. I like him. And I, and of course the, the fucking guy, uh, Aiden Gillen from, uh, or I don't know if he, maybe it's Gillen. I can't remember how to pronounce his name. Anyway, fucking mayor Carcetti, mayor fucking Carcetti from the wire. He's on game of Thrones too. I'll watch that motherfucker read a phone book. I'm a huge fan of his. Well, so let's not forget Dominic Monaghan. Who? Oh, Who? the irony! I forgot Dominic Monaghan. Don't you see what I did? No, never mind. <laughs> Nobody fucking uh, my humor sucks. My point is that I dig the cast. Like, there's there's people in the cast that are fucking cool. I'm down for that, and I I like the premise of the game. I like the premise of this game that plays with broken time and what you can do with broken time. I'm just very I'm just very curious about what else there's going to be to do with that other than 
the specific things we saw in this gameplay demo. But I have to say, of everything here, this was the one thing that I saw that was like, mm, I kind of wish I had an Xbox. That looks like that could be cool. Yeah, this didn't quite get me to the level of I wish I had an Xbox. Uh, I, again, this was a weird one for me. Like the, it, it was, you know, uh, I, I'm a big fan of Remedy. It had uh, your typical Remedy melodrama, which can go either way. I think in Alan Wake, yeah. the, the melodrama played a little bit better. You know, in Max Payne, it, I think it was perfect. I think that's the best of sort of uh, their attempts at the use of melodrama. Um, okay. Because I, it played very naturally into that noir style story. You get into Alan Wake, it was more of sort of a Stephen King vibe, and I and I felt like um, that that sort of um, that kind of storytelling, that very melodramatic storytelling, played okay, but not as well as it did in Max Payne. Sometimes it felt contrived. Um, here, uh, it it feels like if, if that's a spectrum. Um, Max Payne being the most appropriate use of it, Alan Wake being a little bit further down the spectrum towards, and eh, it doesn't quite fit. I feel like here the melodrama um, feels just a little bit further to the right of uh, Alan Wake, and and and, and I and I can't tell, I can't tell if it's going to fit. You know, I think we need to see more of the structure of how this is going to be set up. Um, I agree with you. I felt like the time manipulation, and we don't know anything about uh, the mechanics of this yet. The time manipulation felt a little bit too ubiquitous. It felt too easy to use. Uh, I assume, based on their previous games, that there'll be some limitation on to how and when you can use it. Um, I mean, it definitely felt very Remedy. Uh, it definitely was interesting. Um, I, I, I And we'll talk about some other trailers a little bit later on, Brent. I did not walk away from it excited about the IP. I did not walk away from it feeling like, God damn it, I really wish I had an Xbox because I love uh, Remedy and, and I, I love this game and I really want it. I walked away from it sort of curious to see more is about the, is about the best I got from it from an emotional standpoint. I, I think I was a little bit more hooked in than you were, but yeah. I mean, you know, that, that's fine. Like, I'm not going to break your balls too bad over this. Nah, <laughs> I agree with you. However, the cast looks phenomenal. Yeah. Um, so I'm really excited to see more about it. I want to see. Uh, I want to see what Sam Link is able to do with the writing. I want to see. You know, they talked about whether or not it's going to be set up episodically like a television show. Uh, Which whether actually could like. I mean, that would be fucking cool. I it mean, could be very like, very like, cool if you just if you just sort of think about the premise uh, of the game. So you've got Sean Ashmore's character whose brother fucked around with time and something went really wrong, and then you've got Aiden Gillian's character, uh, Gillian's character who is. You know who who is like travel through time and like come back changed for the worse, and there's something about that drama of discovery of like trying to piece together like what the brother had done and 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 how he'd gone about it and you know just like where did things go wrong? Something about that journey of discovery feels like it would be a perfect fit for an episodic kind of game series. So. I don't know. It would, it would. So I'm very interested to see more about this. They did the release. They did announce a release date of April 5th, 2016. So I would imagine as we get closer, sort of through the holiday season, we'll start to see more. A lot of games coming out in early 2016. Yep. All right. Um, probably, probably one of the biggest, one of the biggest, most talked about things from the show. Yep. Mirror's Edge Catalyst gameplay trailer. Yeah. Um, I would like to take a moment here to thank YouTube for 60 frame per second support on yes. videos because <laughs> it really really paid off with this one i agree the the, the videos really you get a real sense of what it's going to look like as a game yeah uh and what this looks like as a game is kick ass nope. that is the bottom line i i i was really fucking overjoyed i mean it's been a long journey for mirror's edge coming back from the the somewhat lackluster first game but you know the the audience was definitely there for this game there's been a passionate interest in seeing mirror's edge continue and i'm really really glad that it's happening they have specified they they have said flat out that mirror's edge catalyst is a reboot and that it is an origin story for faith that it, it chronologically takes place before the events of the first game but really the f events of the first game never actually happened this is this is the quote from fucking ea dice so they are basically zeroing the scales and just saying we're going to start all fresh and take all the things about the first game that we liked, which is mostly faith, the the traversal, the the parkour mechanics, and the uh, and the com well, I was going to say the combat, but like the hand to hand stuff, all that uh, is kind of there intact. And 
Man, this fucking demo was great. I mean, like everything that you kind of want out of a Mirror's Edge game, you got here. The the traversal stuff, the parkour, getting into the building, the the, the kind of the, you know the conspiracy aspects, the what's going on here. There's there's information that we don't have, and bad things are happening, and bad people are doing them. And then the the escape sequence there at the end, when the action really ramps up and things uh, things start getting hairy. I I mean everything about it, I loved. It was exactly what I hoped, you know, we'd see from the game. If if the rest of the title is indicative, or if this is indicative of the rest of the title, I'm very very pleased with what they've done. I think this this was a good this was a good first step as far as showing us what Catalyst is going to be. I, I agree with you 100, percent Brent. I love the fact that they're doing a reboot. Uh, I, I love the fact that they said, "Okay, we get it. Like you liked it, we liked it. We realized there were some missteps there. We want to we want to redo, kind of, um, which I love. And this game looks like everything you wanted the first one to be, and a little bit more. It looks freaking gorgeous. Oh yeah, uh, I'm thrilled they've taken out the the gun gameplay or whatever. Totally um, unnecessary. This this game like this game in both in both like the traversal in in the combat this game is about momentum it is about forward momentum and anything that doesn't enhance that or or bolster that useless get rid of it yeah I love it man I love it I absolutely love uh, everything about what we've seen so far I'm excited to see more I hope that I don't know if you noticed Brent but in this trailer there was a little bit I felt like there was a little bit more of seeing Faith herself. Uh, I think I think uh, Faith is a really interesting character, uh, both as a person and um, graphically. I think she's interesting to look at. I like her look. Yeah. Uh, and uh, a couple times in this trailer, there were either cutscenes or uh, I really liked when she was jumping through the window and you could see her reflection. Yeah, that was a great way to end. That was in the a window. Great and way I lo- it was one of the things about the first game that I wish and I dug. I really dug the cutscenes in the first game that were that looked like cartoons. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. But I also wish we would have seen a little bit more of her avatar. Uh, not that I don't want to. Uh, I want to play like the parkour in third person. I don't. I just wanted. She's such an interesting character, and unique character. I would like to see her avatar a little more. And I felt like in this trailer, we got to see her avatar a little more. And I'm curious if that also plays out in the game. But um, the game looks freaking gorgeous. The parkour looks uh, like it should after a couple more years of development. I'm really excited to see more gameplay from this game. I agree with you, man. I'm I'm pretty excited about it, also. All right. So next up, Brent is is probably my favorite. <laughs> this is my favorite trailer from Gamescom itself. Um, and I say that caveat because we're going to talk about one more game that I guess technically wasn't really from Gamescom, but yeah. um, uh, I, I, this is not only was it my favorite trailer from Gamescom itself or my favorite video, but also is uh, one of my most highly anticipated games at this point. I have to be honest. Um, I knew it would be like when when I saw this, I thought of you. I was like, "Man, fucking Lauren's down for this game." Believe. Oh my god, I love it! I love it! I love it! I love it! And that is, uh, we got three minutes of gameplay. I just watched it again this morning. Uh, three minutes of gameplay from uh, Unravel, uh, which is, if you it remember, looks great. It, it looks fantastic. It is a side-scrolling plat- physics-based puzzle platformer, yep. um, starring a little yarn dude. Start Yarny. His name is Yarny. Um, and uh, we got three minutes of gameplay trailer where they talked a little bit more about the mechanics of the game. They showed you um, one of the levels, and they show you how using your yarn, uh, you could do different things and, and really interact with the physics-based nature of it. And, I, man, I just think, I think this game looks gorgeous. I think it is, uh, it looks like it has super interesting, emo- I, I just I love the aesthetic of it, first of all. Mm-hmm. This is one of those games that makes me look at a game and, and just marvel at what, creative minds are able to create along the lines of a little big planet. Yeah. Um, secondly, um, I think the gameplay mechanics look super interesting. And thirdly, a- and I'm very excited about um, the emotional content in this game. And I think this character is a brilliant little character and I'm just, I, I could not be m- um, more thrilled to see more media of this game. I loved it, man. I absolutely loved it. Yeah. I, I thought it looked really promising. The gameplay definitely looks strong to me. I, I love the puzzle mechanics. I-, I love the, I love the whole idea of, the yarn being this tether that simultaneously can hold you back, but also unlocks a lot of the the puzzles that you're going to solve. You have to do through creative use of the yarn, but you also have to have enough yarn to to do those things. And just all the ways that that's going to play out in gameplay, I, I feel like you kind of get a good look at in this in this gameplay uh, trailer. So all of that was cool, and just you know, hearing the dev talk about 
the the kinds of the kinds of things emotionally that the game is designed to hit on and you know the idea of uh of you know relationships and nostalgia and and how the setting that we see in this demo uh you know being on on the co- on the coast there and you know how that was something that was special for him and remembering back to you know to going there as a child or you know going there as a parent now himself with his own kids all of those things it's it's really really fascinating to me uh, to see how those kinds of those kinds of emotions play out in video games as opposed to other pieces of art uh you know it, it's it's easy i think to it's easy to to watch uh watch a film sometimes and to kind of at least feel like whether it's accurate or not at least you can kind of feel like you you understand the the emotional point of view of of the writer or or you know maybe of like the director and like what they were trying to convey like maybe a sense of loneliness or a sense of paranoia uh those kinds of those kinds of qualities and it's but that's the thing is like we're so used to seeing that i guess like in film and tv that you know maybe it it doesn't have the same magic but something about seeing how the ideas of of emotional content working their way into games and like all the the different ways that that can happen and the different gameplay mechanics that come out of that something about that i find really really fascinating and i i I thought it was very charming this demo and uh, i think that the game gameplay looks really really fun as well so Thus far, hitting on all cylinders for me. Yeah, the, the only thing I'm having difficulty reconciling, Brent, is that this is coming from EA, and so all I can hope is that the Empire doesn't destroy it somehow. <laughs> uh, all right, Brent, next up, uh, uh, and last up in the garage this week is something we were very excited about. We talked about it last week. We waited till August 5th, like they told us we would have to. Absolutely. This isn't, I guess, ex- uh, uh, discreetly like Gamescom news. I think it was done separately, but... Uh, yeah. And that is the worldwide reveal trailer, which I have watched multiple times. Yes, have I. Uh, for Mafia 3. Oh, yeah, baby. Oh, yeah. No gameplay here. No real sense of what gameplay is going to be like. No, just violence. Just, I think, I think though, that what it does, though, it gives us, it gives us the, the, the time, a little bit of the setting, but uh, certainly the time and, and uh, just a sense of like the people they're going to be involved and the fact is like it's a new day it's a different it's a different time and i I thought that you know driving along in the car and like tuning the radio and then you hear uh all along the watchtower uh jimmy hendrix's cover and um it like it it, i mean it does like it, it immediately puts you like right in a certain time and place in history and and everything starts to kind of fall in after that but it was cool, man. I mean, it it definitely got my attention. It was a cool trailer. It was a good piece of media. They did some good kind of storytelling with the trailer in terms of things like the time and place. So as of right now, I'm nothing but excited. Yeah, so I have questions for you, Brent. Okay. First of all, how do you feel about Louisiana? Uh, I'm fine. As a setting. I- I'm, I'm fine with it. I mean, there's, there's, lots of, uh, there's lots of cool possibilities there. Secondly... Did you think that, do, do you think that, there's been no talk about this whatsoever, mm-hmm. but do you think that the fact, I don't know if you remember the sort of the closing shot, the four of them standing there, yeah. you think that's alluding to co-op? Yeah, I mean, that's what I thought of. When I saw that last shot, I thought... I actually, I actually thought of, I sort of thought of Left for Dead. Yeah, I, I mean, that's exactly uh, what it calls to mind. It calls, it calls to mind Left for Dead and a lot of other games that have four-player co-op. Yes, that's what I thought of. Uh, uh, all right, what, uh, let's talk about the inclusion of Vito. Uh, how did you feel about that? Was that exciting to you that uh, Vito from Mafia Two? Yeah, I mean, was I, in the I game? think I think you know because that's like the 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 problem with like with moving ahead as far in time as they have, which I mean, at the, at the very least, we're talking the late sixties. It might right. it might even be the seventies, early seventies. Yeah. yeah, late sixties, early seventies. I think they my my impression based on what I read is like there's a Vietnam connection, sort of late sixties and then maybe maybe it moves on into the very early seventies. Yeah, so as far as it's moved ahead from the first game, it'd be easy to kind of do that and it have no connection to the first game and just you know, basically just be an entirely other title that says right. Mafia Three. So to me the fact that they are tying it in with the second game, I think it's important. I think that, that is I think that's a good step to take in in unifying all of these things and and assuring people that it's not just uh you know some fucking game that they're stamping mafia 3 on but that it is uh it it is in some way even if it's just a very minor one but it is you know kind of a continuation 
of where the franchise has been before. Yeah, I also think it's interesting that they're moving away. So the first two games were very much about the uh, Italian mafia, yeah. uh, the kind of thing we're used to seeing in the Godfather movies, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Uh, and they're moving into the black mafia, which I thought was interesting, uh, but still keeping ties. And I'm curious to see how much the... Uh, at first, until we see Vito, you think that uh, the Italian mafia is not necessarily part of it anymore. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, and obviously it is. Frere. That's right. And so uh, I thought this was fantastic, man. I love, uh, at first I was a little sort of taken aback, you know, given the tenor, uh, the, the time period of Mafia 2, and I love Mafia 2. When, when, when I first started getting, when, when all along the Watchtower started playing, I was like, wait, what? That doesn't make, that's not the Mafia that I'm used to. No. Uh, you know? Um, but it's cool. But as I mean, it went on, I, I think it's super interesting. My only, my only true regret is that Yafit Koto is no longer alive to be part of this game that is the only oh. thing that is the only thing that could have been greater than this is if like it's like mafia three starring yafit koto it's like mother <laughs> you're right you got me uh, i'm down yes. for this yeah i'm very very excited about this and i hope that we get a deluge of information sometime in the near future so you say that now and then you're gonna get that deluge you can be like oh man like i've seen so much on this just hurry up and give me the game i want to play already that's true. They should. You're right. They should just give us the game. <laughs> Sustain. All right, guys. We are back. We are going to skip the clubhouse this week because we spent so much time talking about Gamescom, and we're going to jump right into the road and talk about what we've been playing. Brent, we have actually. We've had just a couple of games. As a matter of fact, one of our listeners uh, on the last episode wrote a comment saying, so are we going to talk about Fallout Shelter and Rocket League <laughs> in the road next week? And the answer is yes. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. But we're also going to talk about about another five games. So we have a lot to talk about on the road. Why don't we jump in, Brent? First, we'll check in on Fallout Shelter and Rocket League. I won't say a whole lot about Fallout Shelter at this point, other than to say that I have noticed an interesting... You know, I started a new game, as, as I said, and I've actually surpassed my old game. As a matter of fact... Uh, if I if I scroll down to the very bottom to the very bottom of my Fallout Shelter, the l- like the lowest room that I've built is at the top of the screen, and at the bottom of the screen is the is the end of the vault, and so literally the end of the end of the vault is in sight for me, you know, because like you know they don't go down infinitely. There is a there is a set depth that you can build rooms. I don't I don't know how many rows of rooms it is, but uh, I mean it's it's a few dozen. But anyway, I I can see the bottom now, and I never got this far in my old game. What is interesting, though, between this game and my old game is how I had much, much better gear in my first game than in this one. I have, like, three power suits. I've got some ridiculous, some ridiculously powerful weapons. And in this game, it's really been sparse. Like, I, I've got a couple of decent weapons. I've got one power suit, but really, by and large is meat and potatoes as far as the guns and outfits go. I have had much less exotic loot in this game. And the irony is that I've probably had more lunchboxes in this game. Well, I know I've had more lunchboxes. But I haven't been getting as as much exotic stuff out of them. I don't know if that's by design. They've done one major update on the game at this point, And I don't know if that's something where they, they nerfed it to a degree or if it's just it's just the random chance going the other way in this game where it seemed to kind of be a little bit more in my favor in my first playthrough. But anyway, that's Fallout Shelter. Still kicking ass. When's it coming out on Android again? Uh, next week. So there you go. I'm, I'm really excited to hear what you think about it. I'm done. Uh, all right. So Rocket League weekly check-in. Uh, I'll keep this brief as well. Enjoying more Rocket League. Okay. Um, very good. The one thing I will say is that I would like to see in the game, and, and, and please understand that this is with the caveat that I paid nothing for this game. Yes and having a ridiculous amount of fun with it. But if there is one thing I'd like to see in the game, it's a little bit more progression. Uh-huh. Um, I'd like to see uh, n- not just like, you know, essentially new new paint or new tires or whatever that don't affect gameplay at all. I'd like to see a little bit more progression. I started playing ranked matches, uh, and, and in ranked matches, your rank improves, and they try and match you against people of similar rank. I don't see a lot of enough progression there. I mean, they do have a leveling system where you're like a rank 18 or rank 19, but it's super basic, and this game is so good, I would love to see somehow a little bit more uh, reward for the l- l- low those many hours that we're putting in. Yeah. Um, but other than that, totally loving Rocket League. Okay. So, uh, f- more games to talk about. So, Brent, I fired up Journey on PS4. 
uh, I was kind of sitting in front of my PS4, didn't feel like playing Rocket League, and was like, I'm bored, what do I want to play? Didn't want to jump into Witcher. Jo- open Journey, and uh, man, does it look gorgeous on the PS4. Wow. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I will tell you, I so I played it all the way through in, I think, one sitting the first time I played it, and I have not played it since. Uh, and I thought, do I even ever want to fire this game up again? Like, do I even want to do that? And it's super interesting going back and playing the game, sort of un- understanding the metaphor that it represents. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just, it, it, it rema- it, it, it's immediate, that sense is palpable to me of, of this being one of, literally one of the great pieces of art created in the human experience. Uh, it, it really is brilliantly, brilliantly designed. And I am actually very sad that this game is a PlayStation exclusive because it is a game that I feel like every person should play. Uh, and, and I mean, it truly is one of the most well-designed pieces of art that I've ever seen. And it's such an emotional experience. Absolutely love firing it up again. If you ever get a chance to play this at someone's house, wherever, you should fire this up. It, it really is a work of art. I agree with you, man. It, uh, it, it remains, it remains a, a high point uh, in, in gaming that um, has yet to be surpassed. Indeed. All right. So uh, the next three games we're going to talk about, Brent, were the PlayStation Plus games for the PS4 for the month of August. Um, the fourth being Limbo, which I've already played, so I didn't play it this week. Mm-hmm. But uh, this was interesting. I don't know if you caught this, Brent, but if you go to the PS Plus section on your PS4, yep. it only shows you Lara Croft and the Temple of Osiris and Limbo as options. Okay. And I looked at it and I thought, I swear to God, Stealth Inc. 2 and Sound Shapes were also options here. Yeah, I thought they were. And they don't show it and I couldn't find it. And so I had to go, what I did was I had to go on the web to look up those games. And then when I, and I'm sure you could do this through the PS4 also. Um, but if you go to the actual game page, you'll notice that you can download it for free. But it doesn't say it in the PS Plus section. When you go to free games of PS, it was okay. very yeah, odd. That, that, very, very odd. That's, uh, that seems like an oversight. But I did play all three of these games, Lara Croft, Temple of Osiris, Sound Shapes, and Stealth Inc. 2, um, uh, and they were fantastic. Stealth Inc. 2 I probably played the least of, Brent. It looks very interesting. It's fun. It's um, very cool. You've played it. I, pl- I played that mostly. That's mostly what I played. Yeah. Um, I-, I enjoyed it. I thought the- I love the lead character. is very endearing. Um, I like the story, and I like the mechanics. It happened to be the last one I played. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it was late at night. I didn't play it, but you played a bunch of it. I played a bunch of uh, yeah. I played a bunch of Stealth Bastard or uh, uh, Stealth Inc. too. Excuse me, on uh, on Vita actually. I uh, I downloaded this and oh. Castle Storm on Vita. Yeah. And so while while my wife and I were hanging out uh, last couple of nights watching a little TV, she's doing some sewing, and I was playing. I was playing my Vita, and I played Stealth Inc. too. And I'm on like I can't remember what level I'm on. But um, I, I mean, I've probably got like two, two, or, two or three hours in it right now, and it's cool. I mean, it's really, really fun. It looks great on Vita. I really would like to play it on PS4 as well. Uh, I just haven't fired it up to do it yet, but I'd like to play it on PS4 as well. But it's a, it's a cool game. It's, it's just like the right amount of puzzle platformer with stealth mechanics. You know, you know like stealth based puzzles. Yep, and. It's cool. I mean, like, like the mechanics are, the mechanics are, are are pretty easy to understand. You only have a few things that you really have to worry about. You know, you've got run, jump, crawl. You've got hit, activate, switch, hack, terminal, and then you can push things around uh, to do certain things. And then they start like building up on top of that. You know, and using steam as an example to uh, using steam and fans to obscure cameras so that you can get uh, get across rooms and just things of that nature. Like, I love the progression of the gameplay mechanics and, and the, the, the difficulty of the puzzles and things as it's gone on. It's been really, really cool thus far. Very, very solid gameplay. That's awesome. Yeah. I enjoyed it too, Brent. And uh, so along those lines, sound shapes, somewhat similar, a puzzle platformer. You're this, a little different sort of central, like interesting mechanic. It's not stealth, uh, but also a puzzle platformer. Uh, you're like this little blob that rolls around on surfaces and you can stick to surfaces and jump off of them, uh, and then you can't touch other surfaces, anything that's red in the game. So the game really focuses a lot on color uh, and sound, and the idea is as you go through these levels, you can progress through the platforming levels themselves and just do what you want, but there are these coins strewn throughout the levels that some you have to like pick up just by the nature of the, the platform that you're going on. Others you can sort of optionally pick up, and each one of those represents some, sorm, uh, some form of... Uh, music and it becomes some part of the score 
Uh, so it's really interesting. And then there's a whole uh, level building system, uh, just like Little Big Planet, which I had no idea about this game was out there. Yep. And so if you go to the community creation, there's some really, really interesting stuff out there. And it plays with both color and music. And uh, I, I, it's a super interesting game. And, and I highly, highly recommend it. And I think would be, did you play this one, Brian? No, I haven't. Not yet, anyway. I think it would be, uh, it originally, I believe, came out on the Vita and then was ported to the PS4. Right. Uh, and I think this would be an excellent, excellent Vita game as well. Go, I mean, I, I got everything. Like, I typically, you know, I just buy everything uh, that, that right. you know, the PSN has. I, I add it to my account. So I'll go, and, uh, I'll go and add this to my download list on the Vita. Yeah, you absolutely should. And I think it would be a great Vita game for you. Um, okay. The... Uh, uh, the other one that I played that I really liked, probably my the one I played the most of, was Laura Croft and the Temple of Osiris. Fuck you! For which I should apologize. So, part of the reason I played, <laughs> part of the reason, honestly, that I played this game, was because you had messaged me uh, earlier in the week and said, "Hey, uh, I got some free time. Do you want to play Laura Croft and the Temple of Osiris?" Crickets, crickets, and, crickets. And I was already asleep at the time. Uh, and uh, missed the message, and so the following morning I wrote you back and said, hey man, sorry I missed the message, but I'd love to play some Temple of Osiris. Let's see what happens. And the next day uh, you said, uh, hey, I might have some time tonight, and I said, great, I have I have plenty of time, and then uh, you didn't uh, end up freeing up your time. Nope, I did not have time um, that night. Turned out that right, uh, and- Z did not feel like going to bed that evening. Right, no and so, uh, so by the time the third day rolled around, and I see these games are sitting there, mm-hmm. I thought to myself, you know, I thought because you had messaged me that you started playing the game. No, nope, I waited on you. Which, which, I, which I have come to learn this morning. It was not the uh, case. It was not the case. So I thought, oh, well, Brent's probably started playing it. I should probably play an hour or so. <laughs> so when we, when we get together, we're I sort of in the same suck. place. Uh, that's exactly right. So I started playing it. Yeah. And hey, man, it's awesome. I'm just really so you glad know. to hear it. It's really awesome. Uh-huh. Uh, so yeah, I totally enjoyed it very much. Like uh, Laura Croft and the what was the last Guardian one? of Light? Guardian of Light, yes, very much like that. I haven't gotten far enough in to know uh, if there are some new and interesting mechanics, but um, isometric uh, game, uh, super fun mechanics, different weapons, different uh, um, you know you got bombs and it's it's uh, very fun, really well built out, lots of lots of interesting dialogue. Uh, so yeah, I look forward. I look forward to playing it with you in the future. Yeah, so do, so do I, Lauren. So do I. Yeah, sorry. Uh, as soon as you have right, time. Last for up, me. Brent. You have one more PlayStation Plus game that you were playing. You alluded to earlier. Yeah, Castle Storm. Castle Storm, man. Again, I played yep. this on the Vita. Although this is also on the, it's also a free game on the PS3. It's available on PlayStation Four. But Correct. it wasn't free on PlayStation Four. That's right. I don't think anyway. Yeah, because four games wasn't enough. Yeah, apparently. But anyway, I played this on Vita, and man, is it awesome! It's so fucking cool. Uh, I do have one major complaint with the game, which I'll get to. But the uh, the, the the gameplay mechanics work thusly: you have initially you, all you have control of is a large catapult, trebuchet. You know, no, no, it's it's a, it's a it's like a fucking catapult. It's not a trebuchet, but it's like mounted like up on the tower uh, or up on the wall of a large castle. And so what you've got is a physics-based projectile slinging mechanic. Like, that's the first thing that you're introduced to. So you've got javelins that you can throw at this thing. You've got spiked balls, and you've got bombs. And the initial gameplay is you've got people marching towards your castle, and you've got to mow them down. So you've got to, like, load up a javelin, and you've, all you can do is, like, you've got to aim this thing. You've got a little bit of an aim hint, that just this, like, real thin line that stretches off and kind of shows you where it's going to land. And then you got to shoot these guys as they're coming towards you. And, and of course the thing to it is you got to lead them. You can't shoot where they're standing. Now you got to shoot where they're going to be standing by the time the javelin actually gets to them, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's, it's really, you know, cool physics based, uh, combat in, in that sense. And, uh, but you know, not stupid and annoying like angry birds. But anyway, so you, you take out some guys, and then it's like, all right, now we've got to take on the other castle. And so you can, you can move with the right analog stick, you can zoom out, and you can pan over. And you've actually got this other castle on the other side of this like, little walkway that, uh, that you're, you're fighting against. And so you've got to start lobbing bombs over there and depleting the castle of health. Meanwhile, they're sending out guys, so you've got to switch between attacking the castle itself, taking out the guys. Occasionally, they'll get into your castle, they'll take your flag, your, your battle standard, and then you've got to, you got to like kill the guy with the flag before he gets it back, and then you've got to send out some troops of your own 
to retrieve it. You've got to lay down cover fire for them. There's just like all these like really cool little things that build on top of each other. And this is just the first fucking level of the game. Like this is the tutorial section. Then you get into the uh, the next part of the game, and they introduce a, a hand-to-hand combat aspect. So now you're controlling a guy. You're controlling, like, this knight, Sir Gareth, or something like that. And you've got a bow and arrow that works the same way as the catapult from the castle. You, get, you, know, you can aim that up, and you can make headshots. You can, uh, you, know, you can fire long distances or real close in. You've got a sword. You've got a block mechanic. And so it's, you know, like all of this takes place from a, you know, a 2D plane perspective. So you got people coming in from the right and the left. You can block and then counterattack. You can, you got the range attack with the bow. And then they put that into sort of a practical gameplay scenario where you get attacked by these dire wolves and, uh, and, and some Vikings. And that actually is a good segue into my problem with the game. The setup for the game is that you have this sort of, uh, Arthurian kind of, knights and chivalry sort of society that's like the blue side and then on the other side uh, the, the the red team is the vikings and it's set up in the lore early in the game that these two factions are at war and then some uh like i don't know some priestess of peace uh gave them these two jewels so they'd stop fighting and they put you down into the game in the shoes of sir gareth playing for the blue team which is the arthurian knights and all of that Horseshit, I say. Why don't I have the option to play as the fucking Vikings? What horseshit <laughs> is this? Um, that is my biggest complaint with the game. Like thus far, I have not found a way to switch fucking factions and play for the Vikings. Because fuck these, uh, fuck these guys with their, their their fucking blue banners and their armor and all that. Give me the fucking battle axe and the ginger beard down to my navel, and I'll rock their fucking world. That's your problem with this that's game. That's my problem with this game. But it's fun as hell. It's, it, that sounds like a, a lot of fun, actually. It is. And my first thought was, you know, this sounds like it might be a decent mobile game. And I don't mean mobile. Like, obviously, the Vita is a mobile platform. It could be. So it actually is. There's a free version on, uh, and f- by free, I mean an ad every 20 seconds. Uh, are you on, you're on iPhone, yeah, right? I'm, I'm so checking there, right now. I believe there is an iOS version. Um, it, it's funny because if you look yeah, at, here like, is. if you look... Yeah, if you look, is it called Castle Storm Free something? Yeah, it's called Castle Storm Free to Siege. Right, exactly. And that's what it's called on the, I was curious if it was the same, because it lists it on Wikipedia as being uh, released on Windows, PlayStation 3, PlayStation 4, PlayStation Vita, Wii U, Xbox 360, Xbox One, and iOS, but it did not list uh, Android. But it is on Android. Mm-hmm. That's good. Um, and it's and it's pretty well rated, although uh, there are a bunch of ads on it. And I think I think there's a pro version. You might be able to disable the ads. Yeah, th- um, this is probably not going to be a game for you. It looks like one of these games where uh, if you're playing on mobile, like they've got oh, you can buy a handful of gold for five bucks, or a sack of gold for twenty bucks. You can buy right. a bag of gems for ten, or a sack of gems for twenty, and. On and yeah, on and there's on. definitely a in the under the I love this under the in app products section where they list yep. uh, on the Google Play Store. It says from ninety nine cents to ninety nine ninety nine per Jesus. item. So you could, in theory, actually buy something for a hundred dollars. And the fact that that's even in there makes me angry. Yeah, <laughs> like, I, I know you you don't like people having the choice to spend money the way that they want to spend it. I, I understand. No, that. I understand. I absolutely do not. They should not be allowed to spend a hundred dollars on Zen. No, they should be allowed to spend whatever they want. I think Except it takes some big can. brass balls to put that into your mobile game. Uh, yeah, I have to say that I'm. I mean, I got no fucking interest in installing this on my iPhone. I mean, I can't imagine it's going to be a better experience than the Vita. No, I'm sure. I'm sure it wouldn't. Absolutely. Do you get ads on the Vita? Nope. <laughs> um, all right. So that's all the games for this week. Many more games this week. Next week, I'm excited, Brent. Uh, Everyone's gone to the Rapture comes out next yeah. week, uh, which I uh, purchased, and so we're going to be talking about that. But uh, as we wrap up the show this week, Brent, let's head out into the sunset. And why don't you talk about first what you have uh, for your into the sunset? All right. I'm going to talk just a little bit about Metal Gear Solid Five uh, on PC. Uh, we've got we got a couple of things uh, regarding the PC release. Of course, we talked about the fact that it's moved up. It's now going to come out the same day as consoles, which is awesome, and we're very happy about that. We also got some screenshots comparing the various versions of the game on different platforms. Surprise, surprise, the PC version looks the best. I was really, really, really excited <laughs> to uh, to pick this up on PC. I thought that the fact they moved the, the release date up to be in parity with the console versions was an indicator that they were very confident that the PC version was going to uh, was was going to be 
really, really finely tuned and run really well as opposed to uh, Batman Arkham Knight. And then I read the fucking system requirements for this motherfucker. And I am not, like, I'm not there. Like, the minimum requirements, the minimum requirements are an, an i5-4460 processor, 3.4 gigahertz or better. And I don't have a fucking i5-4460. I've got an i5-2500. K. Uh, and everything else, I'm better than. I mean, like, like everything else, I'm, I'm fine. Like, I've got, uh, you know, I've got, uh, my graphics card is fine. I've got plenty of RAM. I, I could I could rock this thing except for my fucking processor, and it it's it's bumming me out because I really want to play this on PC, and I really don't have the money to upgrade my processor. So I guess that leaves me playing the PlayStation uh, the PlayStation Four version. I, I'm kind of bummed about this though. I, I just I don't know, man. I, I'm at the point right now where I'm I'm so so sick of you know it, it, I'm so sick of worrying about my PC games and how they're going to perform. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, there, I, I honestly, I found myself at times over the last couple of weeks wishing that my Witcher three was on, um, my PlayStation four, cause I don't want to fuck with a PC right now. And so, uh, I, I'm worried about uh, metal gear solid five until it actually comes out. I would have concerns about that. And so given that, I don't know, you know, at this, I don't know, at this early stage of the game where the parity between the two, two platforms is the most similar, um, I'm less, I have less concerns about it. It's one thing towards the end of the life cycle when, you know, my, my 970 five years from now is going to be a, I don't know, 55, 70 or something. Yeah. Um, it'll be a huge difference between the two, but so are you going to get it on the uh, PlayStation four then? Or are you going to upgrade your, your processor or upgrading the processor? I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, that, that does not seem, that does not seem like it's going to be happening right now. So, right. uh, you know, I just dropped coin on, you know, on the SSD and the graphics card a little while ago, and I'm still paying those off. So probably not. I, I, I'm thinking that I'm probably going to get this on PlayStation four. I just, I can't see myself coming up with the money to upgrade my processor also, uh, and being able to, uh, or at least in time for this game to come out. Fair enough. All right. So, uh, Brent, my Into the Sunset this week is about uh, virtual reality. We talked, there was a little bit of virtual reality talk at Gamescom this uh, week. Yeah. Uh, and, and what I was particularly drawn to, and there's a really many great things. cover on fucking Time Magazine. Um, one, of, one of them, uh, there was. Have you not seen this? No. Oh, my God. No. I mean, this is like all the fucking, like, like it's, it's your new cute cat meme all over again. Hang on a second here. Time VR cover. I am so happy to be able to introduce this to you, Lauren. I really, no. really am. Oh God, it's fucking terrible. Yeah, just just All just right, Google so, image search it. Of uh, Time Magazine VR cover. Yep. Oh my God, really? Yep. It's Palmer Lucky, like jumping in the air, like this. I mean, he like he's on the fucking horse with Vladimir Putin. He's on the fucking Titanic with Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, I mean, you name it, you name it. Like this, this picture has gotten photoshopped into everything. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> I just saw a picture it's very of, unfortunate. Like, of Lion King where he's holding him up like he's Simba. Yeah, yeah that too. Uh, <laughs> I, I have to, I have to say that I, I think that I think Time Magazine fucked him about as hard as they could. That is, uh, that is fantastic. That is absolutely fantastic. I had not yeah. seen that. Oh my god, that's awesome! Um, sorry, I'm looking now. I, I did Google and image search. And the show it. just derailed. And the images of, of Palmer Lucky with <laughs> in Jurassic Park yeah. with the. I mean, I can't. They're all. There's so like two people holding him like he's a little baby. I can't. Oh my god, this is awesome. Okay, we're doing a show here, right? Yeah. Uh, so anyway, um, the article that I'm alluding to in my Into the Sunset is Ubisoft's. It's titled Ubisoft's first attempts at VR show impressive maturity um and lack of nausea uh, and what i really liked about this story this is an ars technica story what i really liked about the story was two things one is that despite the fact that uh um i think ubisoft is like i said ubifying too many games um the fact is is that there's a large one of the biggest game studios that's out there right now is investing time in vr and i love that um, they talked about the Eagle demo, which I think is really interesting. I think you guys should read this article. They talked about taking the uh, famous scene with Voss where he talks about the definition of insanity from Far Cry 3 mm -hmm. and reproducing it in VR and how compelling and disturbing it was as if it wasn't disturbing enough to begin with. Right. Um, 
So I, I just thought this was a, 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 a an excellent article. And as we move closer and closer, there were several people who posted about the HTC Vive uh, on our website, Brent. Uh, and and a couple of people posted like this is causing me to you know maybe lose interest in the Oculus Rift. And I don't quite understand that. Um, I don't think we've seen everything from Oculus. Um, you know, one of the uh, whatever they they both look like interesting headsets. But the fact is, is that we're we're on the cusp. We're on the precipice uh, in the next six to ten months or so of virtual reality becoming a consumer reality. And the fact that the software companies are on board and starting to work on it uh, just makes me very, very excited. So I was very happy to see, um, uh, pro, you know, um, experiences coming out of Ubisoft. And I'm looking forward in the next six months to hearing reveals from Oculus and Steam talking about uh, some of the larger software companies and the partnerships and the stuff that they've been developing. Sure. So I thought this was very, very exciting. Yeah, for real. All right. Uh, with that, Brent, we're going to call it a show. Uh, as usual, we want to hear your comments about everything we talked about, whether it's virtual reality, Metal Gear Solid, Castle Storm, Stealth Inc., Sound Shapes, Lara Croft, and the Temple of Osiris, Journey, Rocket League, Fallout, Shelter, and then, of course, the amazing amount of content we talked about while we were hanging out in the Garage, Mafia 3, uh, Unravel, Mirror's Edge, Catalyst, Quantum Break, Divinity Original Sin coming to the consoles, Crackdown 3, Homefront the Revolution, scale bound and anything else that you want to talk about related to games any other games common for information or experiences you want to share with us please do we always want to hear your thoughts it's the whole point of the website and the show with that he is brent adams i am lauren baumgarten and remember you don't stop playing because you get old you get old because you stop playing <laughs>